Good morning and welcome to Harvest Community Church for our online service. I'm so glad that you've joined us this morning and I'm excited to be able to worship together with you even though we are virtual. Um, we we'll still get the chance to play music and to sing together. The second line of this song, Come Thou Fount, is tune my heart to sing thy grace and that is my prayer for myself this morning and it is my prayer for all of you that are watching that we can give up to God anything that is hindering our hearts from giving him glory and from singing him praises and from worshiping him with all of our hearts this morning so I pray that we can do that, that we can tune our hearts to sing His grace this morning. So let's sing together.
Well, good morning. It's good to have you join us for our worship this morning. We uh, just want to let you know that we love you and we're glad that you're, you're tuning in today. And we have several announcements we'd like to draw your attention to as we continue uh, this uh, November 1st uh, Sunday. And uh, as we've been, noticed before, we uh, are giving Thanksgiving baskets uh, each and uh, to families in our community and part partnering with Monroe Middle School. And, and they're $30. And if you'd like to uh, have a basket for yourself or for a friend to give away, we'd like to know from that. And we'd appreciate if you'd let us know that. They're $30. And uh, we just uh, are, are just thankful that we as a church are still continuing to, to uh, minister to our community and to our, our Monroe Middle School. Also, uh, we, if you've noticed, we've had these uh, Christmas signs. Uh, and they're red on one side and green on the other. It says, Peace, Love, and Joy, Love of Jesus. And they're 10 bucks. And if uh, you'd like to have one, please indicate on your communication card that uh, they're, which color you'd like, either red or green. And so we can have that for you. Also, uh, if you can't afford uh, 10 bucks for that, we just let us know and we'll get you one and uh, uh, take care of that for you. Also, uh, we want to let everybody know we continue to want you to fill out your uh, digital communication cards and let us know any prayer requests that you might have and uh, anything's going on in your life and any way we can help you uh, continue to navigate through this difficult time. Uh, please let us know for the, uh, that. And uh, we remind you that we keep praying for you each week in staff meeting. We send out these, uh, your prayer requests. And we thank you for how well you're communicating with us each and every week. And uh, we just uh, thank you for that. And love you and just uh, pray God's special blessing on you this week. And, and uh, we just uh, want to pray for you this morning as we get started today. Father God, we just thank you for the privilege of of being together today and we pray God that your spirit would touch us as we look at uh, what uh, your will is for our lives. We just thank you today and we love you Lord Jesus. We give you praise and honor and glory in your name we pray. Amen. Well good morning Harvest Church. It's good to be with you on this uh, beautiful Sunday morning. It's hard to believe it's the first one in November but it is. We're glad that you're able to worship with us. We just wish that we could all be together. I know all of us uh, feel that way, but we're glad that we can connect uh, through this video. And uh, just trust that you would remember Marcy as she prepares for surgery next week for Brian and the family. God, we would lift her up and keep her in our prayers. So let's pray together before we get into the Word of God. Father, we thank you today for the privilege of uh, coming before you with the Word of God. It speaks to our hearts as only you can. Father, I pray for everyone who is listening today and everyone who will be in our services. And I pray, God, that you would just uh, speak to our hearts about your will for our lives. God, you, you desire to, for us to know you and you desire for us to walk in faith and victory. And God, you just want to show yourself real and alive to us each and every day. So, Lord, help us today through the power of your spirit to really connect with your word today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The message today is entitled, Knowing God's Will for You and Me from Romans chapter 12, 1 and 2. There are a whole lot of things in life that cause turbulence. Uh, we have decisions that we have to make that's caused a certain amount of turbulence, conflict, and a lot of confusion. And even in the spiritual realm, that is the case. Many times we have to make decisions on what kind of life I'm going to have. What kind of talents and gifts has God given me? What college or university should I attend? What mate is best suited for me? What career or careers will I have during my working years? How will I be able to afford children in this costly world? These are a few questions that are hard to figure out in this th crazy thing called life. You know, the English language for most of us was a little bit difficult to master, but think about individuals that come to our country and English is not their first language. Let me give you a few examples of how difficult it is for them. I read across this article that was entitled, How Hard Is It to Learn English? 
And that's, the reason for that is because of heteronyms. And the definition of heteronym is a word with the same spelling, but with more than one meaning or definition or being pronounced differently. Here are a few examples. The bandage was wound around the wound. The farm was cultivated to, to produce produce. The dump was so full, the workers had to refuse refuge. We must polish the Polish furniture. He could lead if he would get the lead out. Aren't you glad you grew up learning the English language as a, an American and not have to learn it as a second language? Yet there's something that's even something harder for us to understand of things I mentioned previously. What is it you ask? Well, that's why I love the, you guys, because you ask the best questions. And that question is knowing the will of God. Many over the years as a pastor ha said to me, how do I really know the will of God? How do I know what God really wants for my life? Well, there's quite a number of passages of Scripture in the Bible that help us understand that. One of those is found in our passage today in Romans 12, 1 and 2. It says this, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in the view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. You see, I want us to look at this morning together what this passage says about knowing the will of God for our lives. First of all, God has restored us spiritually. You have heard Pastor Brian say and other pastors say, and I've said it before, when you come across this word, therefore, you have to ask this question, what is it therefore? Or what is he referring back to that he said before? Paul states that because of the disobedience of the Jews, we as Gentiles have been grafted into the vine of Jesus Christ. Paul states that because the Jews disobeyed God and did not follow God, the Gentiles have been shown mercy. In, in uh, chapter 11, verse 32, it says, For God bound everyone over to disobedience so that he might have mercy on all of them. For the Bible says, For all of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You see, God has brought us back from spiritual death to spiritual life. We are a new creation and a new creature. The old is gone, the new has come. It was made all possible, Paul says in previous chapters and verses, because of the mercy of a loving God who wonderfully and miraculously and benevolently had mercy on us to redeem us. I believe that therefore goes back even further from chapter 11 back to chapter 9 when it says in chapter 9 verses 14 through 16, What then shall we say? Is God unjust? Not at all. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. You see, the, the Bible is very clear that God chooses to have mercy on whom he, he wants to have mercy. And He hardens those who He wants to harden. As you go back in the Old Testament, you remember Pharaoh. Uh, God tried to get Pharaoh to let the nation of Israel go, and he chose not to. It says that Pharaoh hardened his heart, and then we come to one passage that says God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Finally, as we look back at the conclusion of chapter 11, verses 35 through 36, we read this, Whom is given to God that God should repay them? For him and through him and for him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. Paul's conclusion is this, because we're no longer aliens and separated and estranged from God by sin, we are now children of God because of the mercy 
that God has given to you and to me. In the Old Testament, in Lamentations 3.21, says, His mercies are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Elizabeth El Elliot, the widow of Jim Elliot, who was a missionary and one of the five missionaries that were slaughtered by the Anca Indians tribe in Ecuador, who he was only 28 years old to, at the time, says this, The will of God is not something we add to our life. It is a course you choose. You either li line yourself up with the Word of God, or you capitulate to the principles which govern the rest of the world. Jim Elliot, before he died, says this, He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. And then finally, another statement by Jim Elliott says, God always gives his best to those who leave the choice to him. You see, it was God's choice to show mercy to you and to me. So what has God done for us? He's restored us spiritually by his mercy. Secondly, we, we read in this passage of Scripture what God wants what God wants for us, He wants us to live sacrificially. He wants us to live sacrificially. He says, Therefore, I urge you, brethren and brothers and sisters, in the view of God's mercy, to offer your body as a living sacrifice. That's pretty clear, isn't it? <laughs> it's a vivid picture painted here for us concerning what God requires because of His mercy that He has given to you and to me through salvation. He has adopted us into his family, and he says that we are to be a living sacrifice. And every Jew and every Gentile that Paul was writing to knew exactly what that meant. It meant something had to die if there was going to be a sacrifice. Yet we are told that we are to present our body as a living sacrifice. It's one thing to be a dead sacrifice because you can't do, a sacrifice can't be, do anything but lay there on the altar and be dead. But a living sacrifice must volitionally stay on the altar because it can climb off. <laughs> but you know, as a living sacrifice, something still has to die. And you know what that is? It's our self-determination, our self-dependence, and our self do it all attitude. I can do it myself. You see, God wants us to choose to live for Him. That's why He gave us this thing called free will. You see, God gave us that free will, but I want to say to you this morning this that free will is also a blessing, but it's also a curse. Reminds me of the story of the chicken and the pig that I heard were walking down the street one day and saw a church sign that said, Brotherhood Breakfast. Ham and eggs. The chicken said to the hog, well, why don't we stop and make a contribution? And the hog said to, the pig said to the chicken, well, it will be a contribution for you, but it will be a sacrifice for me. You see, God could have created us with the capacity to love him no matter what we wanted. You see, if you had the ability to cast a spell on someone, as Pastor Brian said a few weeks ago, and have a magic genie where you go, wiki, 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 and make that special someone love you no matter what, would that truly be love? No. No, it wouldn't. Sometimes in the back of our minds, we would come to the point where we would say, do they love me because they love me, or do they cause me, love me because they don't have a choice? but to love me. Sort of like that child's game that we used to play with flowers. You remember it? You pull the pedal off and said, he loves me, he loves me not, she loves me, she loves me not. You don't know till you get to the very end. But you see, my friends, I want you to know that there is a blessing and a curse in free will. The blessing is we get to choose to follow Jesus with our whole heart as a living sacrifice. But the curse is that we can choose to follow the temptation presented to us on a daily basis by the world system. And I'll talk about that more in a little bit later. But the Bible goes on to say in this passage of Scripture, it is holy unto the God, unto the Lord, when we choose to live a sacrificial life. 
because of the sacrifice that Christ has done for us. We please God when we choose to live this life of sacrifice in obedience to the new life that He has provided for us through the power of the Holy Spirit of the living God. None of us could do what is required in sacrificial living apart from the Holy Spirit, giving us the strength to stay on the altar of sacrifice. It says it is holy and pleasing and acceptable sacrifice when we stay on the altar. You see, back in the Old Testament, Cain and Abel were to give a sacrifice or an offering to the Lord. And Cain did not give a, a, a proper offering and God rejected it. And an Abel offering he did accept. You see, it's interesting that in this passage, true worship and proper worship is sacrificial living by each and every one of us individually. We are to daily worship God through the way we live, through the way we give ourselves unto God, the way we offer ourselves to God each and every day. I ran across this illustration of worship by William Templeton, who was an Anglican English Anglican priest, and he says, For worship is to quicken the conscience by the holiness of God, to feed the mind with the truth of God, to purge the imagination by the beauty of God, and to open the heart to the love of God, and to devote the will to the purpose of God. It's a pretty good description of worship. You might think this morning as, as we talk about worship and say, well, I thought worship happened on Sunday as we gather together around the Word of God and around our singing. And you're right. But true and holy worship is, is when each individual believer sacrificially worships the Lord every single day and we come together in corporate worship to be filled up with the Holy Spirit after six days of private worship, and we express the thankfulness of God all together, and that is true and holy and purposeful worship. What God has done for us, first of all, He, he restored us spiritually, and secondly, what God has required of us physically is sacrificial living. Then the third thing, God wants us to be transformed. Paul begins verse 2 with a prohibition and an admonition. The prohibition is not to be conformed to this world, which is diametrically opposed to sacrificial living and giving ourselves sacrificially on the altar. The word conformed in the Greek is the word schema, which means to shape or to scheme, or it describes a plan of the devil. It's where we get the word schematic. It is the devil's plan and scheme or diagram for shaping us into his image instead of us being shaped into the image of God. That's what Paul talks about in Ephesians chapter 6 when he talks about our battle is not against flesh and blood but against principalities and powers and spiritual dark forces in heavenly places. You see, the great deception happened in the garden. If the devil had a theme song, it may be like the one from the 60s singing group, the American breed, entitled Bend Me, Shape Me. The words go like this, Bend me, shape me, any way you want me, as long as you love me, it's all right. Bend me, shape me, any way you want me. you got the power to turn on the light. But you see, the problem with that, the devil... And in in 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen says, He is a masquerader. He masquerades as an angel of light. He wants us to bow down to Him in worship. You remember back in Matthew chapter 4, when Jesus was tempted in the wilderness, He had the audacity to ask Jesus to bow down and worship Him. You know, if He asked Jesus to bow down and worship Him, He didn't have any problem asking you and me. You see, the world laughs in the face of total surrender to God and flashes sin before our eyes on a daily basis to satisfy the desires of our heart. The world system is the thinking of Satan to destroy the lives of everyone, not just believers, but unbelievers as well. 
You see, Satan is no respecter of person. He wants to destroy lives. Because the Word says he was a liar from the beginning, and he comes to kill, steal, and destroy. Dwight L. Moody, the famed evangelist, said, Christians should live in the world, but not be filled with it. He said, a ship lives in the water, but if the ship takes on water, it soon will sink to the bottom. So if, if Christians live in the world and they let the world get into them, they soon will sink themselves. If we're honest, we have allowed Satan's propaganda to enter in our lives each and every day. Now, I'm probably going to quit preaching and go to meddling now because we really do allow Satan's delivery system to enter into our, our lives every single day through the television, through the computer, through our phones, through movies, through emails, through Twitter, through Snapchat, through TikTok, through video games. Now, are any of these intrinsically evil? No. But can they be used for evil? The answer flat out is certainly these things can be used for evil. Getting back to free will, here comes the curse. Because we can let the devil's conforming propaganda from all of these instruments come into our lives and to alter our minds with sludge if we choose to. You see, the choice is ours. That's why I said there's a curse in free will. It's wonderful to have free will to love the Lord with our heart, soul, mind, and strength. But it's also the free will can pull us away from our surrender to God. Think with me for a minute, if you will. What the Bible says about family, marriage, sex, gender, love, loyalty, and honesty. Just to name a few. That's not an ex extensive list, but that's just to name a few. Then think with me, if you would, in your mind's eye, how TV, movies, magazines, popular culture, music portrays these biblical issues. Well, if we're truthful... And honest, the contrast is striking because they are trying to rewrite what the Bible says is pure and holy into what Satan says is the world's standard. Then here comes the antidote or the admonition to the devil's tricks of conformity. Paul says that we are to be transformed. How? By the renewing of our mind by our minds that are renewed and stayed upon Christ Jesus our Lord. You see, the mind is where the devil attacks us. In the recesses of our mind, that's where he comes in to invade our very thought process. He attacks our minds. He places evil thoughts into our minds. And I, if you've ever done anything wrong, the devil will call to your memory and my memory exactly how evil and how sinful we are. Why is it hard to control our thoughts and not let these things pop into our minds? Because we are allowing these things into our heads and into our minds. He's constantly reminding us how terrible we are. Many times in my own life, when he starts accusing me of something that I've done, I said, you're right. I, I, am, I am wrong. I have sinned. But I'm willing to get under the blood of Jesus, and are you willing to go with me? And he has to take off because he, he's not going to come under the blood of Jesus. I like what Isaiah 43, 13 says for us. Remember not the former things, nor consider the things of old. You see, our sins have been forgiven. And any time the devil tries to bring up our past sins, you say they've been covered under the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, Paul, probably one of the greatest saints in the, Old, in the New Testament, writes this about himself. He said, I see in my members, in Romans 7, another law waging war against the law of my mind, making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my very, very members. In verse 25, he says, Thanks be to God through the Lord Jesus Christ. So then I myself serve the law of God, not with my mind, but with my flesh. 
I serve the law of sin. Finally, in Romans chapter 8, verse 6, he says, For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. You see, how are we to be changed? We are to be transformed. We have a transformed mind in order to know the good and perfect will of God. How is this made possible, you might ask? Again, I'm glad you asked. The only way is that our minds are to be stayed upon Jesus Christ. Over in, over in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 9, I want to read this for you. Listen very carefully to what it says. 1 Corinthians 2, beginning with verse 9. How is it, as is written... Eye has not seen, nor ear has heard, and what no human mind has conceived, the things that God has prepared for those who love Him. These are the things God has revealed to us by the Spirit. The Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. For who knows the person's thought except his own spirit within them? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except The Spirit of God. No one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. What we have received is not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, so that we may understand what God freely has given us. How do we know the will of God? Well, we have to understand what God has done for us. He's restored us spiritually. We have to understand what God requires of us physically to be a living sacrifice. We have to know what God wants for us. That's for us to be transformed. And then finally, we need to, fourthly, we need to understand that God's desire for us is to know His will. Isn't it interesting? It said, but be transformed by the renew in your mind. Then, then, refers back to being a living sacrifice and being transformed. Then, you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good and pleasing and perfect will. Through the mind of Christ that is given to us from the Holy Spirit of God, we can know the will of God. Not only can we know it, but it says that we can test it. Now, many of us are like Gideon. We say, well, we want to put out a fleece like he did in the Old Testament. But I want you to understand that that is the exception and not the rule. How do we determine the will of God? How do we know the will of God? Well, there's several ways we can know the will of God. There is a litmus test in determining the will of God. There are people a lot smarter than I am, theologians that say there's Two ways, to, there's two kinds of the will of God. The sovereign will of God, the perfect will of God, and there are others who said, well, there's a permissive will of God. So I want us to look at those for a minute. The sovereign will of God says that God is the supreme authority over all things, and everything is under His control. Very clear in, bio, in the Bible that God is sovereign, and, we could, and there is that sovereign will of God. Then there's the perfect will of God. The perfect will of God is God's divine plan for your life and my life, whether it be your mate, your children, your career, your ministry, where are you going to live? God has a perfect plan for your life. And then there are some scholars that say that there's a permissive will of God, and some say that there are situations that God allows us to choose two things that are equally good choices, while other scholars say that letting man choose deludes the sovereignty and divine will of God, but I'll let you decide on that yourself. <laughs> I can't make that determination. But we do know that God has a perfect will, is sovereign and divine. There are numerous passages in the Bible that the word test shows up. The majority, 50 plus, are negative. Do not test the Lord. Do not put the Lord to test. There are only three passages that I was able to find that were the positive of test. 
One of these is the passage that we are looking at right here. The other one is Malachi 3.10 when it says, Test the Lord in tithing and see if He will open up the windows of heaven and pour out so much blessing you will not be able to, to, to hold it all and, and keep it all. Then 1 John 4.1 says, Test the spirits and see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out in the world. And then this passage, it says, We have the ability to test and approve the will of God in our lives. How do we do that? Well, we can do that several ways. I like what Henry Blackaby said in Experiencing God. He says there are several ways to know the will of God. And he says here they are. Number one, we know the will of God by looking at God's Word, searching God's Word for the will of God. We can know the will of God through prayer. You see, we can knock on heaven's door through our prayers and ask God, God, reveal yourself to me. Let me know your will. Let me know what you desire for my life. Then the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's job is because He knows the mind of Christ. He can give us the mind of Christ. And if we're looking for the mind of Christ and God's will, the Holy Spirit will reveal it to us. Then there's wise counsel in other believers. They can help us in determining that will of God. And then God arranges circumstances so that we can clearly understand what the will of God is for our lives. Folks, there's merit in seeking counsel of other believers as well. Proverbs says, a wise man listens to the advice of others. In abundance of counselors, there is safety in Proverbs eleven fourteen, 14. And Proverbs 24, 6 said, in abundance of counselors, there is Victory. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, but blessed is the man who walks in the counsel of the godly. It is very clear through the Word of God that we can, in fact, know the will of God. The Bible is very clear that God does not choose to hide who He is from you and from me. He desires to let you know and let me know what His will is for our lives. That's the reason He's given us this love letter. The psalmist says, I have thy word if I hid in my heart that I might not sin against God. He has given us this love letter. And this love letter is for us to search and to know what God's perfect will is for our lives. You see, God is a God of communicating love and relationships and His will to us, you and me. Can we know God's will? The Bible's very clear. The answer to that is yes. Is God willing to let us know what His will is for us? The answer to that is clearly yes. He is not in the business of hiding what He wants for you and me. The one thing I want to, for you to take away from this message today is that we can know the will of God through our surrendered life, transformed mind, and dependence upon the Holy Spirit. This morning, you may not have ever placed your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. His will for you this morning is that you would come to know Him as your Lord and Savior. His Word says very clearly that He came to seek and to save those who are lost. This morning, if you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, His will for you is to know Him, to be saved. And I'm going to pray this morning a prayer of salvation for you. And I trust that if God has spoken to your heart about His love for you this morning, that you would want to accept that. Let's pray together. Father God, I pray for those this morning who are listening to this message that have not placed their faith in Christ. They come this morning desiring to have that kind of relationship with you. And they need to pray a prayer such as this. Lord, I'm a sinner. I, I, I realize that I can't save myself. I realize that you have uh, transformed our, our hearts through your mercy and your grace and I ask you to save me. I ask you to come into my life to live. I ask you to forgive me of my sin. I give my life over to you. I place myself in your hands for you to save me and give me your love and peace. 
In Jesus' name, amen. This morning, if you've made that commitment to trust Jesus as your personal Savior, we'd love to hear from you on your digital communication cards, or you could uh, contact Pastor Brian by, by, uh, through email, brian at harvestcommunitychurch.com, or ricky at harvestcommunitychurch.com. We'd love to hear from you. But I'm also going to pray a prayer for those who may be struggling with knowing the will of God this morning. Father God, I pray that you would help us all to seek your word, to seek you in prayer. Lord, to ask the Holy Spirit each day to let us know the will of God. And Lord, we would seek your counsel and counsel of others that we truly would come to know God's perfect plan. May our lives be a living sacrifice that we would not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by a renewed mind that we truly would know what that perfect and holy will of God is for our lives. We just thank you and we praise you, Lord Jesus, for your power in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. We miss you. We can't wait to be all together again. In the name of Jesus, go in peace and have a wonderful, wonderful week.